I was saying is the response on this part of the curve could be a function of the equivalent plastic strain or parameterized by it. So you can have in the simplest case, you know, the next or the the next more complex from perfect plasticity. So in the, the simplest case is perfect plasticity, you know, one tiny degree more complex would be a linear hardening model. And then you can go on to do all kinds of other complex things such that you can have actually families of curves that are a function of the strain rate, plastic strain rate. This is actually quite typical of most materials, including rocks, certainly most metals. The, the faster I load them, the harder they get. Uh, not, I say harder, the, the stronger they get. Right? So uh, typically for like a metal like a steel, uh, for every decade of strain rate, you know, so I'm talking like on a logarithmic scale, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2. For every decade of strain rate, the strength of the material will increase by about 5%. Uh, that's typical of a, me of a steel. Okay? So, so now we're going to use this equivalent plastic strain rate to parameterize it. And of course you can have other internal state variables and, uh, or other variables. And I think we wrote it in the most general way before, but one of the most obvious is temperature. And temperature will usually cause softening. Right? So when when you have anything other than perfect plasticity. Now, you actually have to solve for lambda dot. It's not a constant, right? And geometrically, what this means, so let's take the, the sort of first case. This is called isotropic hardening. So geometrically, and when I talk about von Mises plasticity, which is also known as J2 plasticity, and it's pretty obvious why, right? The yield function is only a function of J2. So when I talk about von Mises or J2 plasticity, or I do any kind of geometric pictorial stuff, I'll almost always just draw it like this, looking down the hydrostat, because it's always a cylinder, right? But what What this means when you have isotropic hardening is that the cylinder actually grows as a function of the strain of the plastic strain. Okay? So as I as I strain it more and more, the cylinder grows in diameter. Okay? And in these other cases it could grow as a function of rate, right? So now it doesn't just grow as the more, you know. So this is called work hardening. And I think most of us know, have experienced work hardening just intuitively, right? Take a paper clip and, and begin to bend it back and forth and bend it back and forth. And if you're really paying attention, it gets harder to bend after a while, right? Because you're, you're actually work hardening the material through plasticity. And so what you're doing there is, is you're getting it, you know, you're, you're moving up this curve. And then, of course, eventually you'll strain it enough that, that you'll break it. Because you, typically, hardening is also associated with embrittling the material, too. Yeah? I know you said there's some relation between lambda dot and the circle where the sub you're looking at, but is there like a time relation so like lambda dot is like the radius of the circle? No, no, no. The radius of the circle is the square root of 3j2 equal to y. Okay, now in the perfect plasticity case, y is just, just, just a constant. It's the yield stress. But what we're moving on to now is I'm saying that y is a function of the plastic strain. Okay, what what lambda is or lambda dot is it's it's again when you find yourself outside the yield surface, what lambda does is it returns you because outside the yield surface is an invalid place to be. 
according this, this remember this is just a theory right uh, I mean it's a theory that works quite well but but remember I mean this is just people made this up you know a real material because again when we talk about the equivalent plastic strain we're wrapping up a lot of complex behavior into one thing right because at the micro scale there's lots of complex behavior slip along atomic planes and twinning and all this kind of stuff right uh, dislocation emission all this really complex stuff in, in the scenario of rocks pore collapse you know lots of complexity and we wrap it up into one thing one variable okay <clears throat> so with that let's you know so now in these more complex cases lambda dot is something we have to solve for in order to solve the you know to write down what the actual state of stress is and you know in the comp in this computational setting it's something we have to solve for so let's sort of outline a general procedure for doing that okay and because we're dealing with you remember we, I called this von Mises or J2 plasticity well, remember J2 is a second invariant of the deviatoric stress right all of this has n all of that we've talked about so far has no pressure dependence whatsoever right so the hydrostatic part of stress can be anything and that's why when I draw this like this it's a cylinder but it's infinite in both directions so it doesn't matter what the hydrostatic stress is it's never going to affect the plasticity according to this model okay remember we're kind of starting with a simple model we'll move on to more complex ones that include pressure okay so because we're only dealing with the deviatoric stress we can actually simplify our formulation a little bit by just only considering also deviatoric strains okay and so I'm going to introduce sort of a, uh, a new symbol E little e and that's going to be a tensor that is you know the deviatoric part of the total strain tensor okay so Sigma IJ minus one-third Sigma KK Delta IJ right so this is just remember you know it's it's very much an analogy with the deviatoric stress right deviatoric stress is this I'm sorry epsilon KK okay so it's just an analogy with that I mean in the deviator the deviator part of any tensor is this operation right and so I now I just introduce a, a little e i j so you know I'm only talking about the deviatoric part okay well our additive decomposition holds for the deviatoric part too uh, you can work out the details but so our additive decomposition that says that the total strain in this case the total deviatoric strain is equal to the deviatoric um, <clears throat> elastic part plus the deviatoric plastic part okay and so if we start with this equation and uh, I'm just going to rearrange it so I'm going to write EIJ minus EIJ minus EIJ equals zero okay and now I'm going to multiply this equation by the direction of deviatoric stress or QIJ right so I'm just going to say EIJ QIJ and everybody agrees I'm not changing anything right I can as long as I multiply every term I can do this right I don't change the equation QIJ minus QIJ all 
All right. That's equal to zero. All right. And then I'm going to substitute in, okay. Uh, I should have been working with rates the whole time, so let's just add dots. I meant to be. All right, so I, I wanted to start, my first equation should have been the decomposition of strain rates, okay. deviatoric strain rates. Okay, well, so then let's, let's plug in the terms we know. This guy right here, we can use our flow rule, right? Because we, we said our, uh, you know, in, with the flow rule, we said that sigma dot ij is equal to lambda dot sij over sij or qij, right? Well, I mean, it's only, you know, this is qij. Right? So it's only a function of the deviatoric stress, so there's no pressure term, so this, this is the same thing as eij. So if we plug that in, and I will in a second, and then this is just the elastic stress, which we know from Hooke's law. So if we, if we write, and I guess I just, I was trying to avoid it, but I guess I just had to go to a new page. So if we, if we write Hooke's law, sigma ij is equal to, we can, we can write it in terms of uh, 2 mu times E IJ plus uh, what? K K um, one third epsilon K K delta I J. So you can verify that. That's just another way of writing Hooke's law. So, so if I'm only dealing with the deviatoric part, right? I sub if I find the deviatoric stress, I take the total stress and I subtract off what amounts to this term. So. The deviatoric stress, according to Hooke's law, is this. And then with that, I can say that that's true. And then I take a time derivative and I get this, right? Because I want to deal with the rate form here. All right? So it's just manipulating what we already know. And so now I have, and of course, this is elastic. I guess. You know, this is Hooke's law, so it's implied. I mean, this, this is the elastic part of the strain. So, so if, I, if I plug in this term and our associated flow rule back into that equation, and I'll write the equation as it was, So associated flow rule here, Hooke's law here, and I have All right, well what's this? Go to one, right? So 
So we have that. And if Sij can be found, Sij dot can be found in a way that is independent of lambda, then we can just solve this equation. But if Sij dot is somehow dependent upon lambda, then we can't solve the equation right away. Right? So let's hold on to this equation call it like star. <laughs>